Smiths, welders. They had a very large machine shop and fitting shop. They made quite a number of the machinery that was used in the uh, factory themselves and modified some standard machinery to their own requirements. My principal function was as deputy to Mr. Whitaker, who was the chief engineer, and I used to stand in for him when he was away, uh, and that was unfortunately frequently because he suffered a good deal from ill health. And um, I was in charge of such things as maintenance, uh, the provision of new machinery, installing it, uh, and all the ramifications of a quite large engineering department employing probably 30 or 40 people. Here are some of the staff in the machine shop. The engineering department was responsible for the good running of all the factory's machinery spread over the five acre site. Any serious breakdown meant loss of profits with workers standing idle. The man overseeing the engineer on the milling machine is Eddie Wood. And here is Eddie Wood today in January 2005. Eddie joined Barrett's after the war, having served in the Royal Engineers with the 8th Army. He was employed as technical development manager. When Barrett's were taken over by the Bassett's group, Eddie went to Maynard's as development engineer. Precise size of the factory, but I think that it covered something like six acres. The buildings were for the most part four-storey buildings, and uh, by the time I got there they all had lifts. And they also had a series of quite vertiginous catwalks between the buildings, so that you could go over the whole of the site, of course, on the ground floor, and also over the whole of the buildings on the second floor via some of these catwalks. The oldest building on the factory was the one that was known as the Piano Factory. When Barrett's moved to Wood Green, they bought a piano factory. It was owned appropriately enough by a man called Mr. Ivory, and that was the first building. They very swiftly put up other ones, but the piano factory was still in use and they actually still had voice pipes there in 1954 uh, in the boiling room so that uh, the man in the boiling room would pull the cork out and whistle through it to the man uh, who was going to uh, make the boiled sweets and they would communicate via this voice pipe. The other buildings of course were put up during the 19 1890s, 1900s, 1920s. But when I got there, the one that was being finished off was the Coronation Building, and that had been designed by Oscar Fabers, and that was actually in use but still being finished off when I got there. A view from the export loading bay with the new construction being built in the rear. Pat Horsby Smith, MP, was invited to perform the opening ceremony. The man on her left was squadron leader Dudley Saywood, an ex-boffin from Bomber Command, now one of the top brasses at Barrett's. The large bell hanging up on the gantry was the factory bell which was moved to Bassett's when the fi factory finally closed up and moved to Sheffield. A view of cars in 1953 outside the office block decorated for the coronation. This was floodlit at night. there was known as the Caxton building and this came about because in the 1930s uh, a German gentleman approached Mr Barrett uh, and wanted to make chocolate. Barrett's of course uh, didn't, did not make chocolate themselves uh, and where they used it they bought it in. Anyway they came to some agreement between themselves and Barrett's held a 50% share in this company which was called the Caxton Chocolate Company. 
and they made the familiar Caxton chocolate, which was sold in sweet shops, but never really um, got off the ground there. But they made quite a name for themselves in making Cuverture. And the basis of their working was that um, they were housed in the Barrett complex in their own building, and Barrett supplied all the services, such as steam and water and so forth, but they were an entirely separate company, with Barrett's holding 50% share in the two years that I was there. And a few that come to mind were a method of putting sherbet centres into sherbet suites. Prior to that, the sherbet had been fairly uniformly distributed around the suite, but the idea was that in a sherbet centre you wanted to be able to crunch the suite and come up with a dollop of sherbet there. So uh, a, a standard machine was adapted. The plastic sugar which was being fed into the sweet shaping machine was opened up with a, a sort of plough and the sherbet fed into the opened up part of this um, sweet by means of a very small worm conveyor, screw conveyor. Then when the sherbet had been deposited in the um, section, the plastic section of sweet, it was closed and went on to the forming part of the machine which formed it into the sherbet sweets. Another one which comes to mind is the manufacture of scalp pipes. These have been made in the past by girls and they've been made by hand, uh, but a method was devised by Eddie Wood of extruding the licorice and by means of cams the licorice was formed into the shape of a pipe and once it had been formed then the um, little um, uh, red hundreds and thousands were put on the bowl, to, uh, the bowl of the pipe to simulate the uh, pipe being a light. Here is an example of scout pipes. Do you remember them? Several children were taken round the factory by Mr Pastry Richard Hearn on a publicity photo shoot and here he is having a good old stir and again mucking about playing with a broom handle as a cue potting sweet billiard balls or are they gobstoppers? Barrett's turned out hundreds and hundreds of thousands of sherbet fountains. Um, the uh, cartons for these were made in-house. They, <coughs> they were made on Hesse machine and fabric machines and uh, it started off with a roll of the familiar yellow paper with the Barrett's name on it um, on one reel and a reel of uh, thinnish cardboard. They were moulded together in the machine and uh, eventually cartons were produced. They were then passed on to an army of girls who filled all these cartons by hand and stuck the licorice tube in the centre and closed up the thing. Well when labour became very difficult to get, and this was after I left, this I believe was some time around about 1960, they tried to develop a means of filling the cartons as they came out of the Hesse machines with the sherbet and put in the licorice stick in. Um, the way that this was done was as the, as the cartons came out of the machine, they were fed into a conveyor uh, with rubber bands and the conveyor was both narrower than the cartons and running at a slightly faster speed than the discharge of the machines. Therefore it made the round section of the um, cartons um, slightly oval, which allowed them to be filled from an automatic filler. But so far as I know, they never actually managed to put in the licorice um, suction stick by machine. That was done by hand and they were closed off. Eddie Wood tells me there were eight machines producing 24,000 an hour between them. Just imagine over the last century how many tons of sherbet that would have been. 
this was possibly one of their best selling lines. When I was there quite a lot of rock was still being made. I suppose they reached their zenith in rock making round about 1939 um, and it gradually fell off and indeed in the 1960s I was told it had fallen off almost completely because smaller firms in the various seaside resorts had set up their little backstreet businesses and Barrett's couldn't compete. But in 1954 there was still quite a bit being made and the, head, the foreman in charge of the department, Jerry Toll, uh, had been there making rock for years and years. It's rather an interesting process. The sugar is boiled and it's boiled in vacuum pans and a, a, a lump of boiled sugar weighing perhaps 50 or 60 pounds, is pulled. And it was pulled on a Barrett-designed uh, pulling machine. The boil was hooked onto one arm and the machine started up. It was driven, incidentally, by a most archaic drive, uh, finishing up with a Lay's wrought iron chain. Completely unguarded, I tell you, too. Um, Anyway, it was hooked onto one arm of this uh, sugar pulling machine and the machine was started and it went round slowly. And just as you thought the boil was going to fall on the floor, an arm the other side came up and picked it up. So that the effect of it was that the sugar was being stretched all the time between the arms of the machine as it revolved. And in doing so, of course, it entrapped air and became white. Meantime, they had taken some of the boiled sugar and dyed some of it red and they made up very large letters. The letters were about um, two inches high and um, two feet long. And when the boil had been uh, pulled, uh, it was put onto a heated table, rolled into a cylinder, and then the letters built up round the periphery of it um, whatever it was, Aberystwyth or South End. It was then cased with some more pulled sugar and then cased with some previously dyed red sugar to make the casing. A chain put round one end, hauled up to the ceiling so it was necked like a carrot, then laid down and the rock was pulled out by hand. And a very skillful uh, sugar puller could pull this rock out down to about a quarter of an inch you could still see the letters. I had a go at doing it but I found it extremely difficult to pull, quite hard work and very difficult to stop it breaking. And you are John? John Elton Barrett. And where did you get pick the name Elton up? Elton was my mother's name and it was requested by some aunts to add it to the name Barrett. This is George Osmond Barrett, who is the founder of the company. He had four sons, of which my grandfather was one of them, uh, and he was knighted. And what was his name? Uh, uh, Sir Albert Barrett. Sir Albert Barrett. And I was the last member of the family to leave Barrett's. At Wood Green. At Wood Green. Bassett's appro approached us as a merger as they considered that they had lines very similar to ours in, in, the, in that they dealt with licorice goods. And of course they were the famous Bertie Bassett's. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we didn't advertise. We had a much larger range, in fact, we met a much greater range altogether um, of confectionery than they uh, had ever put together. And the 